Oh. Thank you, thank you. Wow. What a nice introduction. The fact that you're here with what's going on outside is staggering, and uh, I'm very grateful that you're here. I would have had a tough decision to make, cook out some burgers on the grill or go listen to that long-winded guy. So I'm glad you're here. It is a topic that has a lot of passion around it. I'll bet for some of you there's a lot of passion around the topic of urban renewal in Fairport. How many people lived in this community during the urban renewal era, just to get a feel? A significant number of people. And how many people didn't? Because that's good, too. First of all, we're glad you're here. It's a pretty good split, actually. I'm going to talk a lot about this topic and a lot of information that has only come to light in some cases very recently. I was just receiving new material as of last week. I've wanted to do this urban renewal story for a long time. And I've found, first of all, it's kind of an intimidating topic. And a lot of times when you're talking about a subject where immense numbers of people were here and you were not, I wasn't. I grew up in Penfield. Um, it is a topic fraught with a lot of emotion. And I don't want to underplay that because, you know, for some families, they lost their favorite drugstore. 
or their favorite pizzeria, that type of thing. For some families, they lost their home, they lost their business. I know one family that had a business on the first floor of a building, four apartments upstairs filled with family, and then a house a couple doors down the street. And imagine the impact. And um, I want to make sure it's recognized that it was a really big deal for some folks. And it changed our village. But our village is a pretty great place, and I want to wind up in that place because a lot of good things have happened since. Urban renewal, and here's a before and after picture. You've probably seen this for ages because I've plastered this everywhere to try to get you to come. I'm going to start by setting the stage because in a way you can trace the roots of urban renewal back a long, long way. Think about what happened in America and therefore Parenton and Fairport. Think about World War I and the impact on a community like ours and soldiers going off to war and the people at home supporting the war effort and struggling and doing without. And then a few good years. And then the Depression hit. And for a long decade plus, the Depression really ravaged a lot of communities. And there are impacts that we can still see in Fairport today from the Depression. Think about some of those houses in village streets, streets like, I'll say, State Street. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Liftbridge, Liftbridge Lane East. High Street, where houses were added onto, where apartments were built, where apartments were built kind of ad hoc on top of garages. Why? To let in extended members of the family, give them a place to live during the Depression. So some hard times. And then what happened right after the Depression? Bam, right into World War II. And so we had these waves of, of challenges. And when we got done with World War II, as I'm setting the stage, we have a TV over here you can see and one here, and I know some of these things are small, but this is a, an interesting factor. 1954 in the Democrat and Chronicle, they reported a exhibit at the Rundell Public Library, downtown Rochester, where architects and artists gave their visions for the future. And it talked about the atomic age of building. But to Rochesterians, it stirs up an impatient longing to see new ideas as swiftly as possible. After everything that people have been through, a lot of people wanted to move on and get on with the future. As we talk about that, preservation may not have been key in a lot of people's minds. Hazleton's Corner Marsh Road, 31F. Here is a newspaper advertisement announcing Hazleton's and announcing you could come and be part of history as they burned down the old house that was there. The East Rochester Fire Department was brought in to burn down the ancient house at that time. Preview, housewarming, more than a housewarming, <laughs> actually a house burning. When the torch is set next Sunday at 1 p.m., the century-year-old house will be burned to the ground to allow us to build our new dealership. And here was that house, really an early pioneer house. And I agree with, when you say, ah, oh, like, by the way, this is Marsh Road, and this post is Route 31F. It's right there on the corner, right where the parking lot is, where Chevys are parked. But if you imagine 31F, Fairport Road, all the way as you're heading into East, uh, to uh, the village of Fairport and the Canal Bridge, that street was lined with old houses long ago. This is part of our past that most people aren't familiar with anymore. But it was changing. Who recognizes this? <laughs> Who remembers the blizzard of 1966? Well, here we are looking north on South Main Street. Do you recognize it? There's our lift bridge. There's the tower from the Cottage Hotel. Look at the snow. I choose this photo because at the same time, the newspaper in Fairport published this little paragraph. Can Fairport merchants continue to attract business from a rapidly expanding populace in outlying subdivisions uh, and from present villagers when faced with increasing competition from nearby shopping centers? So try to imagine what was going on at the time. We had our merchants at the, in the village 
but all across the area, subdivisions were growing, people were coming in that don't live in this community, welcoming those folks to Parenton communities, O'Brien homes, so many of them, but they didn't have any familiarity with the village of Fairport and shopping there. Look at this demographic chart. The census, the federal census, Parenton, in 1950, 11,559 people. 10 years later, we were up to 16,000, but 10 years after that, it doubled in 10 years. Almost 32,000 people came to the town of Parenton and the village of Fairport, but mostly the town, in 10 years. The vast majority of those people had never shopped in a village store before. Today we have, by reference, about 47,000 or so residents in our community. But that growth, that unparalleled growth in that 10 years, has a lot to do with what Fairport was dealing with at the time. Plazas were being built. You know, Panorama Plaza down in the valley in Penfield. Country Club Plaza, which we still have. A lot of competition to draw shoppers away from the village of Fairport. The Wegmans Plaza, it was called, at Mosley Road and Pittsburgh Palmyra Road. This is where Pet Supplies Plus is today, and there's a liquor store right here. And of course, they closed down this Wegmans, and they're back behind it. But these were the booming new shopping places. Parenton Square Mall across the street. Pittsburgh Plaza was absolutely uh, a major impact on drawing shoppers away from the village of Fairport. And finally, Eastview Mall in 1971. And look at the timing, 1971, just as Fairport was edging their way into urban renewal. I didn't see the fundamental data for this chart, but there's some alarming information on this chart, and I know it's small, so I'm going to walk through it. This was done in 1974, polling Village of Fairport residents on different topics. How do you feel about the availability of parking in Fairport? 73% inadequate. Variety of stores. 82% said poor. Appearance of stores, 69% poor. Selection of goods, 62% poor. Now folks, if you had a store in the village of Fairport at that time, I'm sure yours was wonderful. <laughs> Seriously though, these were perceptions that were gathered, and I'd love to see the fundamental data that stacked it up. Overall, the data came out pretty, pretty bad. Then they compared it to downtown Rochester, Eastview Mall, Pittsburgh Plaza, and on, the other plazas that I just showed you. And the numbers were overwhelmingly positive. This was helping to make their case for a rebirth of the village of Fairport. And it wasn't just happening in Fairport. These are newspaper articles from many places. Uh, urban renewal, of course, happened in Rochester, but a little bit earlier. But places like Hornell, uh, East Rochester, you're familiar with the Technoplex Mall, Newark, and many other places were dealing with urban renewal at the same time. This one is about Fairport from the Brighton Pittsburgh Post, and it's from 1975, and saying, Fairport stores wait to close, urban renewal victim. And a lot of people did feel like victims, yet some shop owners, building owners, were anxious for the change. They were ready, based on their own lives and what was going on, to accept the money that they could get and move on. So there were varying points of view. When did urban renewal actually start, the process in Fairport? Earlier than you might think, 1962, January 1st, these are actual village board meeting minutes from January of 62, and a representative of the uh, Housing and Urban Development Corporation came and was given the tour of Fairport. And from that initial tour, they immediately started talking about targets for implementation of urban renewal. That is, the taking down of old buildings and the putting up of new infrastructure. I've outlined some here in red. The initial urban renewal plan is far different with, than what we wound up with. The south side of High, High Street, close to North Main. North Main Street on the west side. And um, a little stretch of West Avenue. And I can show it to you better in a photograph. This is a photograph of Main Street looking south, North Main Street. Here's the canal, here's the lift bridge. So I've colored for you, this is the area of High Street. This part, so if you enjoy going to the Village Inn, it would be gone. 
Here's the, uh, the uh, steak sandwich place. Uh, it went down to the railroad tracks, just this stretch and then one part of West Avenue. That was the initial view about urban renewal. What were some of those buildings? Well, on, on Parsi Avenue, just a couple of buildings, really, but you might recognize this. It looks a little churchy. Part of the high street, right? Oh, High Street, yes, High Street. That's our first Catholic church. That building still stands, by the way. And this barn structure, which is a little modified but still stands today, actually started out way up on South Main Street at the top of the hill and was moved here in about 1925. Those were the two structures on High Street. And now we're looking south on North Main Street. This one actually was burned by fire and lost, but all these buildings along here would have been lost to urban renewal in the original plan. Want to take a break and see a 10 second movie? This is, I thought I'd throw a couple of these in, because this is a 1938 film of uh, the train crossing the tracks at the tracks that we have today. And it's color. This was taken by Bob Kramer before he joined the Army Air Corps. We lost him during the war, but he left us some wonderful films. Not quite urban renewal, but it's fun. So, by 1965, planners were saying, act now to preserve. You might be saying, preserve what? It sounds like you're tearing things down. Big story about preserving, and they put in this map, which honestly is very difficult for me to understand the point of what they're trying to accomplish. But listen to their words in this big newspaper article in our Fairport newspaper. Here's the objectives. Modernize the business district. Major emphasis on an enlarged municipal building. And what they started to talk about is a municipal building. Remember, at the time, you know where Village Hall is? Well, that was the town hall and the village hall. And we had a community center on East Avenue, the Crossman Center. And we still had Potter that was limping along as a, as a community center. So they're talking about an enlarged municipal building and the picturesque potential of the canal. Well, that happened create a large industrial area on the north side of the Barge Canal, and finally reduce through traffic problem by creating a new roadway running along the north bank of the canal trail. Well, that's where the towpath is. So some of these things that they talked about never happened. Many of them never happened. Finally, make an all-out effort to preserve village charm and revitalize the business district try to win back some of that business that they saw in their survey was in trouble. By 1965, this is the area that was identified for urban renewal, renewal. And this is the area that wound up being impacted. So we have South Main Street. Here's the canal. This is the area where Packett's Landing is over here. All these buildings are at issue all through here. The north side of West Avenue. And then the east side, Dudley... Uh, Dudley Lumberyard over here, the Village Hall is here, that whole area. And again, I can show it to you in a photograph. I've shaded it blue so you get a better feeling for the scope of that. No longer are we on talking about High Street. No longer are we talking about North Main in this version. But we're talking about a significant area of the Village of Fairport with some of the greatest concentration of commercial properties. Does all this make sense so far? A big issue with so many people was the safety and the uh, disruption of the railroad crossings. And not just in Fairport. Grade level railroad crossings have been an issue in America for 100 plus years. And people were concerned about the possibility of more and more accidents and how could we minimize those accidents. In Fairport, when you combined a lift bridge that often broke down in those days, with railroad tracks, two families of railroad tracks, and sometimes, we've all seen it even in modern times, a train that gets across the tracks and then sits. So there was a lot of energy on the railroad and the issues of the railroad and things like this that would happen. 
And you know, sometimes when you're dealing with the railroad, you get the idea that someone up in an ivory tower with the railroad is saying, well, you don't understand. We're the railroad. <laughs> when, when there's piles of gravel in your main street. So these were the issues that were also driving people and perceptions of the lift bridge as well. Perceptions of the lift bridge. Did you know, you know, the lift bridge was uh, open for business in August of 1914. By the 1930s, people were already trying to figure out how to get rid of it. In the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, there was always a group of people that said, what are we doing with that relic? We can do better than that relic. And in modern times, it's far more reliable than it was back then. This photo uh, was one of about 20 that I found on eBay, 8 by 10 photos that were actually part of a Department of Transportation study that I have only come to realize fairly recently was part of the very topic that we're here to talk about today. So you're going to see some drawings that are pretty interesting uh, that were provided to me by a very kind individual from the DOT recently. Um, in the process of, ev of evolving this plan, the 1968 Urban Renewal Report, there was an Urban Renewal Corporation in Fairport with a very small number of employees, but mostly volunteers that worked to try to implement this thing. They were very passionate about it, and there were reasons why many people thought it was so important not the least of which the data that I already showed you. So they came up with a mock-up of a model, and I have more on that in a moment. But in 1968, they came up with three plans, plan A, B, and C. I've highlighted C because that's the one that they wound up gathering around. But the first plan, a rerouting of Main Street to the east. Imagine that. Rerouting of Main Street to the east using the present right-of-way as a pedestrian walkway. Just imagine picking up Main Street and moving it east. They very quickly said, hey, that's kind of a dumb idea. <laughs> Plan B, assuming Main Street would, remove, would remain in its present condition, all commercial activity grouped together on the west side of Main Street, possibly a covered mall. The east side of the street was reserved for a municipal complex. So again, we're talking about a significant municipal complex. By the way, think about where we are now, a significant municipal complex. Because that kind of plays into it. And then C, which they settled on, so I'll make bigger. This is based on the assumption that the village and the state will see through to completion the elimination of the railroad crossings and the lift bridge. Bridging of the canal and the tracks with one continuous span. You may have heard it referred to as the flyover bridge, viaduct. To do this, Main Street would be gradually elevated to a height five feet greater than the south end of the bridge. Honestly, when I've read that, I thought, how could it be that low? It seems like they would need to go higher than that to get the boats under. So this was the plan that they started to settle upon. And I've tried to depict this for you because that bridge, when conceived to replace the lift bridge and go high enough over the railroad, imagine a very high thing going over the village of Fairport. Way down here is Pleasant Street, way up here, this is High Street. I only learned in the last week that the plans actually went all the way to East Avenue. And I'm gonna show you a drawing that will make your head spin. So, elevated, elevated bridge. Now, how to survive with businesses and traffic that wants to go to those businesses in that environment is hard for me to understand. Bold in concept, they called the plan. And here are some pictures of the actual model that was developed. This was a three-dimensional model made out of foam board and glue and itty-bitty little cars. It's, you, you can start to see where we are, I would say that this is right about where the library is today. So the buildings don't quite look like what happened. But this would be over here, Village Hall would be here. You get the idea of this concept that was available for you to go see and inspect at the Urban Renewal Headquarters, which were on South Main Street in a building that was destined to be torn down. A Couple of more models, bold in concept, 1968. I will say, 
it is very difficult for me to go completely chronologically because if I do that, thoughts will escape from my brain. So we're going in a little quasi uh, chronological manner. But here in 1970, a newspaper article starts to talk about, yeah, but what about preservation? Historic Fairport homestead lost to urban renewal? Question mark. And there's actually two great homes here. Um, this one was the home of Bob and Winnie Wagner. Bob was a local judge. And this, this home, which is that one up there, a lot of people said if it were still here today, it might be certainly be one of our most important historic landmarks. And this one, I'll show you a great picture of this one in a moment, but this is where members of the Pitnero family live, some of the members of the Pitnero family, along with having a business just a few doors down. So people were starting to worry about preservation. We're losing too much of our history if we go forth with this plan. In fact, some, some kind of ad hoc almost, non-governmental preservation entities, groups of people started to mobilize to start to push up the pressure a little bit about saving properties. But a tool that could be used and was used was eminent domain. Defined as the power of the government to take private property and convert it to public use, referred to as a taking. The Fifth Amendment provides for eminent domain, can only exercise this power if they provide just compensation to the property owners. Um, the Fairport Herald published in 1971 this statement from our Urban Renewal Commission that said, the agency wishes to negotiate in good faith and hopes to successfully purchase all properties on terms agreeable to everyone. However, the agency will not hesitate to use its right of eminent domain if our offers are ignored or if we cannot reach a negotiated price. So it all became very real very quickly. By 1972, you remember the concept drawing I just showed you? By 1972, some different drawings started to crop up that didn't look quite so radical. In fact, here's the Bound Building, built in 1890, that remains in the drawing. Here's another old facade. So some of the, some, and there's the lift bridge. If you can just get a hint of the lift bridge on the far right. So some drawings and renderings started to suggest that maybe all of this didn't have to go away. Here is another one, and this was drawn by an architect who was on our local urban renewal commission, Leonard Rosenberg of Dewey Avenue. And this one is interesting for several reasons. 1972, the lift bridge is still here. Here's Village Hall. Here are some old buildings mixed in with some new stuff and a park. And look what's in the park in this concept drawing. Why, that's the Wagner's house. So the idea was to pick it up and move it into a little park. Now you know the park did happen, right? That's Canale Park. The idea was to pick up and move the Wagner house. The Wagner house um, was deemed by the Urban Renewal Corporation and their plans to be so important to the overall design of Packett's Landing, that it had to go. They felt that way because you pulled into Packett Landing when you're going to the library or the dollar store or wherever, the entranceway off South Main Street is exactly where that house was. Exactly. Here we are with a view of South Main Street and um, this one right here, by the way, is the Pit and Arrow building where their shoe store and the Norton's cleaners and then apartment apartments upstairs, and then their house was right down this way. And this is the east side of South Main Street with many old buildings. And these buildings were the subject of engineering studies. Urban Renewal commissioned studies to determine the viability of these buildings. What they found is some of them were more viable than others. This particular building, does anybody remember Rudin's store? Yeah, well, Rudin's, here's an earlier picture of that building and an even earlier picture of that building. Isn't that terrific? This is on the east side of South Main Street, just a couple of doors from the canal. Back to the engineering studies. For Rudin's, 
they went on to say, in our opinion, the building is a short-term life expectancy, less than eight, eight years, should be included in the urban renewal program. The opinion is based on lack of structural soundness and general poor condition of the entire structure. But then they lose me. It's not based on aesthetics, however, which are lacking to even the most non-discriminating eye. They sounded so unbiased till that last sentence, I'm afraid, speaking as a preservationist myself, with my preservationist bias. In the meantime, here we are in 1973, and the money is starting to be tallied for urban renewal, because imagine the pressure that people were under to revitalize this village. Business is down. All those shopping areas in the county are booming, and shops in Fairport aren't doing so well in many cases. And millions of dollars are being offered uh, in total. But individual property owners on West Avenue, because this impacted West Avenue, and South Main Street were offered pretty significant money. Now, if they saw urban renewal coming for years and years and years, how many of those would have plowed more money into their building if they knew that urban renewal was coming? Some did. And some of these buildings were in wonderful condition. But some of them said, well, holy cow, they started talking about urban renewal in 1962. My investment in my building is not going to pay off if they're just going to buy me out. So some of those buildings were deteriorating over time. And remember when I went all the way back and talked about World War I, the Depression, World War II? All of those factors also played into, in many cases, the structural integrity of those buildings, especially the Depression. Village Hall, Town Hall, May 29th, 1975. But for Village Hall, they reviewed three options. 1975 now. Plan one, elimination of the grade crossing, including the lift bridge, which will re be replaced by a fixed bridge, the flyover bridge. That's plan one. Plan two, elimination of the grade crossing and leaving the lift bridge. Hmm. Plan three, elimination of the grade crossing only with the consolidation of the railroad tracks and leaving the bridge. So plan two and three say leave the bridge. We have the bridge, so that must be what happened, right? They picked one of either two or three. That is not the case. Four of the five village board members voted for plan one. The most severe plan, remove the lift bridge, fly over bridge over the whole area, all the way from East Avenue to Pleasant Street. Mayor McDonough was the only one that dissented. He voted for Plan 3. So it looks like you know, the die was, was cast, and we were going to lose our lift bridge, and we were going to have that flyover bridge over the railroad. So communications went out to the state to help make that happen. Wheels were in motion. Um, uh, how can we solicit the assistance of the state in speeding up the project? But in the meantime, it appears that somebody went around, kind of did an end run, and said, wait a minute, let's have a village referendum vote <laughs> on number one, number two, number three. Now, a lot of folks were against that. They were happy with the plan number one. In fact, one gentleman came to the village board meeting and said, wait a minute. He appeared to question why a referendum is being scheduled in November to decide a plan when we've already picked the plan. You picked plan one. So there was pushback. There was a lot of energy on both sides. June and July, 1975. Now, what a mess this is. <laughs> Just when I thought I had the story fairly well figured out, I heard from a wonderful person at the DOT and they provided me with some old prints, old drawings of concept. Now, these are not for the entire area. These are actually for North Main Street. And you don't have to squint too much all at this one, because I'm going to show you a more readable copy. But this one was dated 1969. So it goes all the way back to that point. And then here's another one from 1975, which is very much the same. But I'm going to keep going, because I'm going to show you one, this one, that I've colored to make it easier to read, hopefully. Now, here we go. 1975. 
What was the DOT thinking? And I should stress, the fact that the DOT was thinking one thing and the village was thinking another with the urban renewal plan, it doesn't mean that they were completely on the same page. The DOT is in the business of transportation. That's what the T's for. So in this case, that's north. Here's the canal. This is all North Main Street. In this case, it says existing lift bridge stays. In this drawing, it shows West Avenue still here. So it's really not comprehending some of the changes that Urban Renewal was looking at. However, let's work our way over. Down here is the Parker Street Bridge. And it says remove existing structure and make a new Parker Street Bridge that connects with the end of Lift Bridge Lane. We know we mean State Street, right? What was it before State Street? John Street, right? You know that? And the good ladies of John Street marched on Village Hall and said, we don't like the name John Street anymore. They said that in the late 20s because they said, we think it has a seedy connotation. We don't like living on a street named John Street anymore. We want a stately street. Why don't we call it State Street? Now, I happen to believe the source of John Street, the name, is because there was a gentleman whose first name was John that ran a mill at the corner. But that's another story. So here we are, if we were to go uh, over the new Parker Street Bridge and go up Lift Bridge Lane to the west, because this is the flyover bridge here, here's what we would do. We would go under the flyover bridge or around this loop. Everywhere where you see yellow is a new road. Here's the most dramatic thing. Here's Main Street, the elevated flyover bridge. They proposed an access road that would parallel North Main Street with these access loops, this one going all the way to East Avenue. And this way, you would go under the bridge and under the bridge again to go to High Street. So if you want to go to East Avenue, from East Avenue to High Street, no problem. Go under the big flyover bridge, loop around, or you could go to Carson Avenue, or you go back under the bridge again to go to High Street. Same thing down here with this other loop, a similar thing to get you to State Street. In addition, you come down High Street, there would be a new road that would go over, a bridge over the railroad tracks, over Thomas Creek, and get you to Railroad Street. We're in the transportation business. So one way to think about urban renewal is look at the things that didn't happen. So we still had our models. And thankfully, the lift bridge was saved. Why? Because right after that referendum that was to be scheduled, the DOT pulled funding for the flyover bridge. That killed it. That killed it. Always go back to the money, right? So to practically no one's surprise, and this is interesting that this is what the Fairport newspaper said, to practically no one's surprise, the long dreamed of Fairport Bridge has been placed in limbo by the DOT. The bridge, which is to be a mighty span covering the railroad, railroad tracks, etc. So it gives you a little insight into the thinking of at least some at that time in 1975. Hence. We can now look forward to another decade of the clang of the lick bridge and the hazards of the railroad tracks. Not a lot of uh, embracing of the old. But here's Turk Hill Road. Here's the before of Turk Hill Road. And why am I showing you Turk Hill Road? Because the flyover bridge did happen. In 1983, they built this bridge that we go over constantly, over the canal and over the railroad tracks. You'll remember there was a one-lane canal bridge, and then you snaked your way through here over two families of railroad tracks. And so it's almost remarkable that it didn't come up sooner that someone might have said, but wait a minute, there's another way to bypass the village if that's your goal. You already have that access road. It's called Turk Hill Road. And that's worked out pretty well. All right, I want to show you some old pictures and then some changes over time. Because to get a feel for really old Fairport, 
we're looking south on South Main Street. So um, these buildings were the ones that ultimately were torn down during urban renewal, as were these. By the way, you might see a pair, two pairs of trolley tracks going down the street. Trolleys never went down Main Street. A trolley company put them in on speculation, just in case they could get the contract for the business. Here's a photo in the same area looking south on South Main Street. And you know, ever since 1875 or so, you see that uh, steeple of the Fairport First Baptist Church. I still get calls occasionally from people that say, Bill, the steeple on the church is tilting off to the east. Somebody's got to get there and straighten that out. It has been that way for most of its life. Time for another quick movie. 1938, South Main Street, West Side talked about the Depression, and in some cases you can see even at this point, some of these buildings, you know, who's investing in these buildings during the Depression? They'd already been through nine tough years, but isn't this great? And then as he walks along, we'll get to the corner of West Avenue, which used to intersect with Main Street and the lift bridge, and you'll see that. Bob Kramer worked at, there's West Avenue, and there's the buildings backing to the canal on the right. Bob Kramer worked at Kodak in the experimental film division, and so they sent those guys home with cameras and said, go photograph your community and bring back the film and let us develop it. Here's North Main Street looking north, and in this case, you know, we had a, we had a trolley, and the trolley's cutting right down over to Lift Bridge Lane, John Street at the time. We can see our railroad gate crossings, one big old light bulb to illuminate all of North Main Street. <laughs> Here's looking east on West Avenue with the lift bridge in the distance. This is in the 1930s. Um, these buildings here were removed right here by Urban Renewal, as were all of these and more. <laughs> Isn't that a stark photograph? We're we're over about where the new municipal bathrooms are on Lift Bridge Lane West. It always adds to a picture when someone's underwear is hanging. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the uh, eastern end of West Avenue. These buildings were backing right to the canal. Maybe you remember them. And this is 1962. A few years later, auctioneer Vince Canale, right there, is holding an auction the day after an arsonist burned this building, which was only about a week after, before it was going to be torn down due to urban renewal. And maybe someone here is in this photograph. Anyone go to this auction? Do you remember? <laughs> really? Son of a gun. <laughs> On the south side of West Avenue, um, if we have anyone that's a member of the Congregational Church, this is the Congregational Church but the one prior to the one that we have today that was built in 1868. Congregational Church, beautiful church across from the fire company on East Church Street, it was built in 1868, but not before this building was moved to West Avenue. Great picture from the late 1800s. And that same stretch, by then, that building was a movie theater, the Bijou, the, the, the dream, the Bijou dream, taken in the middle of a blizzard. So all of these were sacrificed by Urban Renewal, other West Avenue properties, it wasn't just buildings, it was houses, and in this case, the dental office of Dr. Whitney, which was on the corner of Perrin Street. Anyone go to Dr. Whitney? Son of a gun. He did good work, I've seen your teeth. <laughs> Perrin Street, we lost one, two, three, four, five houses on Perrin Street. And I've taken this from the corner of West Avenue, looking up the loading dock from behind the dollar store. So these houses were all through here. And if you go there today, I always tell kids when I'm talking to students, there's a reason you're seeing what you're seeing. Why is there houses all along Perrin Street, and then there's a spot with no houses? It doesn't make any sense. Of course, there were houses there. And here they are. Five nice houses, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, this one was the home of the Hooker family, and uh, this was their business on 
uh, West Avenue. They own the one horse grocery, and there's the horse. <laughs> here's, here's Father Hooker and son who just got back from Sodas Bay and catching a lot of fish. But look at the DeLand Fire Company band out there in front of the house. Just wonderful. And an advertisement for the one horse grocery. <laughs> Advertising hard time prices. We know you're having hard times, and we've got hard time pricing for you. In all, by my count, 13 houses and 28 buildings were lost during urban renewal. That is a big number. What you see here, the, the surviving village hall behind us here, which was also the town hall at the time, what you see was fully allowed. People were allowed to come with their cars, trucks, wagons, and take building materials with them. Take bricks, take stones, take stairways. I've talked to people that have done all of those things. And in fact, Auctioneer Canale auctioned off some things or really priced some things really cheap. I heard uh, a gentleman talk about buying an entire stairway from a building for really just a few dollars. So I, I don't like showing these pictures, but this is what it looked like. This is the west side of South Main Street. Here is that pit and narrow building, Tony's Shoe Store sign still on there. And I, I, that's the story that I can't get past. It's the most vivid example I know of, of a family that had a wonderful house with extended family, with a building, with a tenant, and then their own two brothers with a shoe store, and then four apartments upstairs, three occupied by family, and the fourth occupied by a lady who took care of the family. And um, that was the subject, the house and that building of eminent domain. They didn't want to go. It was a very traumatic experience. And honestly, I promised family members that I would talk about that emotional impact that existed, not just for them, but for a lot of other people, too. This was the Pit and Arrow home. And here's a picture of it. You know the other classic house I showed you, the judge's house? A collection of glass plate negatives some of you may have heard me talk about before were found in the judge's house 75 years ago. This is one of them, and it's so fun to be the historian and figure out we're talking about this house that that car's in front of. And here are our Civil War veterans and their wives surviving in 1914 in front of that house. Beautiful picture, really. And here it's being torn down. And in fact, you can see in front of us here, there's a flat roof. This is taken from the second floor of, of the municipal building, right across the street. The Wagger House finally went in 1976, and it didn't go without a fight. The Waggers were very, uh, or Wagners, were very um, um, professional and understanding and feeling like maybe we need to get out of the way if that's what the village thinks needs to happen. But a lot of others put up a big fight, historians, community groups. And as we said, it almost got moved, but it didn't. Meanwhile, right after it was torn down, groundbreaking is announced, set for Saturday. We're in August of 1976. The Landing Mall, ironically, a return to village life. And think about how long this is. This is almost 50 years ago. And so plans and construction were planned. And, and I'll bet a lot of people were excited about a 24-hour grocery store within walking distance. Uh, Tops Foods, where the, where the gym, what's the gym that's there now? Gold's Gym. So certainly some assets, some photos of the construction. And now, Canale Park doesn't exist yet. The canal's right over here. You can see the edge, almost by the lift bridge. And these are the remaining buildings on West Avenue. And here we are building our parking garage. And you know those entrances that are across from Moonlight Creamery, if you're familiar? Uh, here's construction looking east. You can see the municipal building in the distance. These buildings are recognizable as they go up. The library would be right over here eventually. This one, I believe, if you see, there's a little boy. I think it's Opie Taylor. <laughs> and, and what a different time. I mean, 
Here's a guy's working, guy's way up on a ladder. This kid's just walking through a dangerous construction site. There are no rules. His, how many of you talk about, well, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have all this supervision, and we were, from dawn to dusk, we were, well, yeah, and this is what you were doing. <laughs> no, no, no safety vest is right. Uh, this is looking across from about Village Hall, or the municipal building, as the construction goes forth. You can still see some houses over there on Perrin Street that survived. Wow, tough place to do business. Uh, looking south, there's the Baptist Church down the way. Now we've got new buildings being built over here, but they haven't yet started the east side of the street. And the new library was part of the plan. It didn't happen, right? But the new library was planned for East Church Street. Maybe you knew that. It was going to be built where the fire station wound up being built. That didn't happen. Uh, this, by the way, was drawn by the same architect that did this building. It may be recognizable if you think of it in that vein. I should say the town hall building. Um, the library didn't move. You know the library was at 18 Parent Street. How many ever spent time there when it was a library? You might be shocked to know it's been the Fairport Historical Museum for longer than it was a library. <laughs> Built in 1938, and these are volunteers that are moving books to the new library in Packets Landing. Did anyone do that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. They ought to waive any late fee that you uh, <laughs> encounter. So the Fairport Library today, and here's an aerial view looking shortly after, after the landing opened here and proximity to the canal, and you can see the, the park is there. We'll get a better shot of that. A lot of changes. The, the Wagner House was right here, then the Pit and Arrow House was right here, and then all the commercial buildings along the way. The bank survived, everything this way survived. Another view, and this is an old view. And so, a view of the canal and the lift bridge, we're looking west, and you can see that this area, which uh, hasn't been developed yet in this photograph, and another view of it from Main Street looking down back where the lumber yard was. Photo from 1979. And then this photo from 1978, you just go over the Parker Street Bridge and you look, and this is what it looked like going back to what is now Village Hall. And this is a modern picture, so you get a feel for that. Now, you may be surprised to learn. Remember when I talked all about a combined municipal building? A community center, a town hall, a village hall, all in one, were proposed way back in the 1960s. This is 1967. A 20-story building. 100 apartments for seniors. <laughs> village hall, town hall, community center. Here are all the amenities that it would have. 200 apartments. Just since I mentioned it, it's double. <laughs> this is a rather fanciful drawing that I made myself. You can tell it doesn't have a lot of professionalism to it. But it is about what 20 stories would look like, and it is where it was proposed to go. Can you imagine? And folks had a fit about four-story condos. <laughs> Five times higher. <laughs> 1981, we weren't done with urban renewal yet. I thought maybe it was already done by then, but in 1981, this is the Parker Street Bridge. Sorry for the little photo. Two little houses right next to the Parker Street Bridge. The last two properties to be removed during urban renewal were these two houses to make way for some of the office buildings that are part of Packet Landing back there and back up to Parker Street. And so just a view from 1921 to 2020 and to see the changes over that period of time. These are the lumber yards that existed way back in 1921 and 40 or 50 years before that. And by 1978, imagine when the CB radio was a big deal. A CB update in the newspaper, a CB update, that'll get people's attention. There's a big celebration coming to Fairport calling Fairport Village Days. 
That's the predecessor to Canal Days. Village Days started right when Urban Renewal provided places, new places for people to go, including Canale Park, including the Farmer's Market, got its birth at the close of Urban Renewal. So soon after, the Village Park was renamed Vincent Canale Park. And uh, he had passed away by then, and there is still this plaque honoring him today. And his family is here. Um, it's a wonderful park uh, to this day. If you think of positive things that have come out of urban renewal, if you've ever been to um, concerts on a Thursday night or other concerts in that area, Canal Days, something that blossomed. And look at how different Canal Days is. People are driving on the street during Canal Days. So this was early. This is from 2017 and just an example of all the things that happened in Canale Park uh, and how it has become an asset. Um, I certainly don't intend to paint uh, a completely negative picture about this. This is a wonderful community to live in and a lot of good things have happened and there's a reason why people call it the jewel of the canal and there's a reason why it's a very busy, bopping place with a lot of thriving businesses. We also have some entities that do some great work in the village, including projects that have been done to revitalize along the canal, both between the two bridges and now west of the lift bridge, both on the library side, the south side, and the north side, where uh, just been vast improvements and Fairport has always been good at getting grant money to do these things. So maybe you've seen the timeline that we have of history uh, where it spells out all the big hitters of what's happened. That sidewalk leads you to the end of Roselawn Avenue. And right across the street, this is an old picture from a couple of years ago, but all new docks over there now and uh, handicap accessible uh, kayak launches and so forth. So a lot of good things. And we still have an urban renewal agency today. But that agency is not to, uh, focused on tearing a lot of things down and replacing them. A lot of people have benefited from front porch grants. And as a preservationist, I can tell you that, boy, there's so much opportunity with so many of our houses in the town and the village, old houses with enclosed porches that are Really now, maybe folks needed that extra room at some time, but often they're kind of empty or they're a closet, and opening them up can be a wonderful thing. Or just refurbishing your, your porch. Uh, home loans for eligible income folks, multifamily housing benefits, um, uh, senior disabled housing grants, a lot of things that that name Urban Renewal is involved with today. And one of the neat things about the internet is there are so many people who are photographers or have become photographers and share their images. I've chosen to use a couple from Nikki Bittner. Uh, there's a lot of terrific ones, but uh, I asked Nikki and she said, sure. This really is a place where a lot of people go. I met a couple last fall who live in the state of Washington, took a train to Fairport with their bicycles <gasps> by design. You know, it, it's still kind of startling when people say, I want to come to your place because it's a fun place to be. It's where I covet to go someday. How about that? Um, another one from Nikki looking at our wonderful canal front. Uh, I'm encouraged by what's going on in our community. Urban renewal was tough for a lot of people. And I, you know, I think if they had it to do over again, maybe we could have kept the facades in many cases and built behind them. Um, but we didn't. Uh, but it's still a very vibrant, wonderful place to be. And uh, I'm happy to call it my home. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. So two things. Some of you are welcome to rush out of here as fast as you possibly can and get some daylight. But if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those as well. Yes? How did it end up looking like something out of the 
Only recent, only recently, and see, we don't know something until somebody tells us or we dig it up in a book or an old newspaper. I ran into a gentleman who told me just recently, you're referring to the architecture and all these dormers and peaks and all of this, and that there was an architect involved in the project that was very familiar with a specific New England, New England location. And I was told, I'd like to verify it, that he was so impressed with that place and the architectural features of it that he brought some of that back to this concept. I don't know. Say it again. What was it? Newburyport. Newburyport. When I say Newburyport, I know that my wife will write it down for me so I can go check it out. But I wonder because that was quite Maybe so. I'm going to check. Wouldn't it be something if we saw the similarity? Yes. The architect was from Russell, Virginia, Pat Canyon. He's the one that drew up all the plans. Pat? Yeah. Canyon. Canyon. Yeah. Probably was the direction. Oh. He's a, not one of the bad guys, and he had his business right it's on when we when we look at the data and just forget the data for a moment. Look at all those burgeoning shopping areas that were exploding, and all the new population that was moving to the town that had never shopped in the village before. It's hard to imagine the village luring a lot of those new folks, tens of thousands of new folks, to shop in the village. I think Peter McDonough had an enormous amount of influence, especially in steering it away from option one and two. I feel, as much as I can tell, I told you that the vote in the village board was four to one, for taking out the lift bridge and having the flyover bridge. And I really want to put that in context because all evidence and, and, and even I found letters to the editor from some of the most prominent members of the community on the north side and the south side that said, get rid of that lift bridge. Put in that flyover bridge. So back to your question, Mayor McDonough, I believe he bought some time with this referendum idea because I believe he probably knew what was coming with the DOT, that they were going to pull the plug on financing and that he needed to buy a little time. Now, that's just me trying to fill in the blanks. But uh, Mr. McDonough was a preservationist. He was a history nut. Uh, at the same time, you had very influential people in the community saying, get rid of that lift bridge. There was one gentleman who wrote letters to the editor every week. And many of them said, when are you going to get rid of the bridge? When are you going to get rid of the railroad crossing? Absolutely. If, if, if the changes had occurred and the flyover bridge had occurred, I would suggest that the essence of the village wouldn't be here and many of us wouldn't be here. Take a look at the bridge at Turk Hill Road, which you almost can't tell it's a bridge when you're going over it. It would look much like that. I'm going to go back here and I'll be back. Yes. So I have repeated that, that Ripley's, believe it or not, has, has featured Fairport's lift bridge multiple times. Having said that, I've never found the actual evidence. Do you have it? <laughs> Either do I, but I hope to someday. Ripley's, you know, and sometimes they just have a little panel in the cartoons. Ripley's, believe it or not, a little panel. What do you got? So he said that, that Witnessing this spurred Pittsburgh on to form preservation ordinance 
to help save property. S very similar things happened in our community, and I'll give you those two examples that are very real. Not with urban renewal, but remember when the Fairport First Baptist Church was in grave danger of being removed and a drugstore was going to be built once it was torn down? That is very specifically what caused Fairport to implement their historic preservation ordinance, which helps very strongly to protect uh, structures. In the town of Parrington, didn't have a historic preservation ordinance until the late 80s, after several important structures had been torn down, the Craig home on Craig Road was torn down to make way for a grass lawn adjacent to the Rochester Tennis Club. Down by Craig Road, Craig Road Park? And yeah, the barn's there. But that appears to be, from what I've read, the last straw where the town finally said, we have to implement a preservation law so that we can have a chance at saving some of these places. Yes? OK, do you tell us who you are? Um, I know that you are a historian. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering if you can speak at all to like, the current perspective of the value of preservation in the village. Like the current perspective of the value of preservation in the village. Yes. Um, we, we still have a preservation ordinance in the village, as we do in the town. At this point, in order to designate a property, it is voluntary on the part of the property owners. Um, and so you have to find property owners that are, you, not only you have to find a, a good opportunity for, for preservation, that it meets the criteria, but the owners need to buy in as well. And so preservationists need to make the case why it's so important. But we have a lot of designated properties in the village and the town. Uh, an enormous amount of work has been done by volunteers on volunteer boards to make these things happen. And so I feel that um, we've done a real good job in our community. And by and large, um, I think it's been very successful. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm proud of what, ha what has happened in both the village and the town with preservation. That's great to hear. Thank you. You bet. I'm still here. <laughs> Wagner House was probably about 1835, 1840. Um, and she asked how old the Wagner House is, that beautiful landmark house. And one of the things that you've got to keep in mind all those brick and block buildings that were there along Main Street, well, those replaced old houses. The street was lined with old houses, maybe not as grand as the Wagner House or as big, but it was lined with houses. In some cases, they undertook a gradual process of going from a residence into a building, bit by bit by bit. In many cases, they were picked up and moved. There's at least three buildings on East Church, houses on East Church Street that were moved in order to build buildings on South Main Street. Um, there is a house on Pleasant Street that was picked up and moved. It was a building on South Main Street. Yeah. We have over 170 moved structures in our community that I've found. <laughs> Caught you by surprise there was a parking garage there? <laughs> kind of handy in the winter. I do not know. Does anyone know if the brick oven uh, pizzeria on West Avenue, if the owners uh, moved to a different location? They just closed down? Um, you know, for a lot of them, they found it as an opportunity. You know, maybe they were thinking about retirement. Maybe they were thinking about ending anyway. That could have happened. OK. So they looked at how much traffic are we going to get with, without a through street. That makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Sure. Changes in the, the, the traffic and modern signal thing, they put, you only use two tracks that you can run either direction on either track. Okay. The other comment about that is, well, the, the other the single track for the West Shore Railroad, which was not really built to do much traffic, it was a, it was a game that they were trying to improve it. Yes. And you could get on a train in that depot, and you would, by changing the track, you would get on another electric train and go as far as the railroad company. Ah, I didn't know that. Very good. He's talking about the Rochester, Syracuse, and Eastern Trolley. Learner? Yeah, and we drive on the left Okay. Oh, gee. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for sharing. What year did they tear down the train station at Syracuse? You know, I don't know. I remember the kids playing in the wreckage down there on the railroad. Yeah, if you're talking about that New York Central Railroad station, and that was about 1959 or something like that. But then there was also, and you know where the railroad viewing station is? Yeah. Oh, right about there was the West Shore station. And uh, that was much later. I, I have photographs that that's still there. But, so it's kind of fun that that viewing station is right where there was a train station. Hey, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you.